Hello everyone, it is Law by Reese here, back with another video. I'm an attorney licensed in the state of Texas, specializing in criminal defense and with experience in debt collections and other civil litigation matters. Guys, I was licensed in October of 2022 and have been out practicing for about two years now, coming on two years. I started my own company, Ringnall Law PLLC, here in Oasis County, Texas, up on July 17th, and have been working as a solo practitioner uh, mostly in criminal defense here in Corpus Christi, Texas, since that time. Guys, I've been following the Thugger Daily, the YSL or Jeffrey Williams trial here and commenting on it for some time now, guys, and I want to continue doing that here today. It is Saturday, July the 3rd, 2024, guys. I do want to thank you for joining me. If you like this content and you want to support uh, solo practitioners like myself, please make sure to use the donation links in the description box below. Any amount of any amount of support helps, guys, as I'm just out here hanging out my own shingle. Okay, guys, so uh, I just wanted to mention that I do not talk about specifics of any of my own cases um, or anything like that. I prefer to stay far away from that. And so I'm here. I'm an attorney in the state of Texas. I am not an attorney in the state of Georgia. I'm not licensed in Georgia. And if you need legal advice in Georgia or any other jurisdiction that is not Texas, uh, please do not ask me. However, if you are in the state of Texas, feel free to give me an email or if you can find it, you can find my business line. If you are in need of legal advice here, especially around the Corpus Christi, Coastal Bend area, um, anyways, feel free to give me a call. Okay, so here on Thugger Daily, we're starting here on August 2nd, another bombshell development in the YSL case. Guys, John Melnick, lawyer for Woody, or Woody, I think is how they call him, will be coming to court on Monday to testify in front of the new judge that prosecutors Love and Hilton have been lying this whole time. So we can see this from the Law and Crime Network, guys, and we're going to have a, a listen. I'm going to mute my microphone, and we're going to have a listen to this video. And he said, uh, you know, I really don't want, I, mean, I told you, I don't want a mistrial. I just want to make it right, and I want the record to be good. So anyway... Mr. Melnick is going to take to task, and you'd make a credibility determination, um, Adrian Love, John Melnick's statements. He also um, adds that he states that um, he and his client, and he did not tell me, I said I don't want to know because it's attorney-client privilege, and he's going to work on it, he said, I assume that's a waiver, I'm assuming that, he and his client. He's saying that what Ms. What, um, Hilton said to the court, and to, by both courts, is not accurate also. All right. Then I have information um, that, that there's oft, so it's not in the transcript, so Mr. Weaver is either not there or definitely not reporting it, that Mr. Copeland did talk about the killing of Donovan Thomas, said it's not on the transcript. And, and he said, uh, you know, I really don't want, I, I told you, I don't want it. Okay, guys, so just to quickly react to this video, um, basically the idea is that one of the assistant district attorneys, Hilton, has not been fully candid with the court and that there were statements in the ex parte hearings that were not recorded by the court reporter, not transcribed by the court reporter, so they were not found on, a, uh, on the court's transcript. Okay, guys, so here's we have the next post from eight hours ago. Surprised more people aren't talking about this. When the cameras were off last year, Judge Glanville threatened to jail yet another YSL attorney, Max Shart, unless he admitted to cursing at the judge. Glanville lied and said he had it on video, but it never happened. Uh, and then here we see part of a, of a motion. Here we have a music video. There we have the post that we just looked at. August 2nd, additionally, Melnick will say that the June 10th transcript is incomplete and there was a conversation between Woody, Miss Bumpus, and Miss Hilton in which Woody says he was involved in the murder of Donovan Thomas. If true, this is, in Steele, Steele's words, the greatest Brady, and Brady meaning uh, in evidence which tends to show innocence. 
Because it seems apparent to everyone that Judge Whitaker plans to continue the case, Max Sharp for Shannon Stilwell, or SB, has filed a motion for fail, fair trial and remedies, outlining many errors and violations that have occurred in the trial thus far. We're going to have a look at that. Okay. And then here we have on August 2nd, Judge Whitaker is excluding a lot of evidence, falling in line with Max Schart's argument regarding, quote, double hearsay and Woody. This is pretty much the first defense motion Judge Whitaker has granted thus far. If she applies the same argument, logic, and ruling to Woody's statements regarding the nut murder, the state's case will be severely weakened. Be on the lookout for her ruling once they get to that portion of the interviews. And then here we see from Thugger Daily, Judge Whitaker is basically giving Woody an instruction manual on how to testify to make his interviews inadmissible. He technically shouldn't be watching the proceedings, but then we have here free this guy. Guys, this is Jeffrey Williams or Young Thug here smiling in court. Okay, here we have Bruce Harvey renews his motion for mistrial after a lot of time is being wasted giving the judge context of what testimony came out, people's nicknames, timelines, etc., so she can catch up. He says it's impossible for the judge to just pick up the case. Denied. Okay, guys, so now we're going to move on to some of the motions. And here we're going to start with Stillwell, motion for remedies after ex parte. And we're going to get to reading, guys. So here we have in the Superior uh, Court of... Here we have in the Superior Court of Fulton County, Georgia, State of Georgia v. Shannon Stillwell, defendant, indictment number 22 Superior Court 183572. We see Fulton County Superior Court. This was filed August 2nd, 2024, which was Friday at 4.06 p.m. Renewed motion for fair and constitutional trial and appropriate remedies for constitutional violations. Comes now, Mr. Shannon Stillwell, by and through undersigned counsel, and hereby files this renewed motion for fair and constitutional trial in the above style case. In support of this motion, Mr. Stillwell shows as follows. And then we have a background fact section. Guys, um, usually you might start, just to provide some legal commentary, you might start with an introduction, um, but typically you do start with the facts and then apply the law to the facts, although sometimes you'll see this you know, done different ways. But it's pretty common to start with facts and then move into legal analysis Although I will say that usually you will have some sort of a brief introduction. Mr. Stillwell is accused of multiple felonies, including conspiracy to violate the Georgia uh, RICO law and substantive felonies. Mr. Stillwell is an innocent man. So for those of you that are outside of the United States or whatever, uh, in the United States, if you're not familiar with this, we have the presumption of innocence. The presumption of innocence means that unless, it's not until, unless you are proven guilty, you are clothed, you are bathed and presumed innocent. And so for those of you who have that feeling that, hey, if this guy is in court, then he had to do something, or this guy looks bad, so he had to do something. That's not how the law works, guys. You are, in fact, innocent until a jury has pr proven you guilty, unless the state has proven you guilty. And so... We have that strong shielding of presumption of innocence, and that's why you can state that before a jury verdict has been rendered. So I got a comment in my last video, somebody trolling me saying, well, he's something like, well, he's guilty. That's why he's still in jail. No, you're not guilty until a, unless a, jur a jury has uh, found you guilty. Until then, you are innocent. Like all citizens, Mr. Stilwell is guaranteed a fair trial and due process by the federal and state constitutions, the Confrontation Clause, the Due Process Clause, and all other constitutional protections. The Sixth and Fourteenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution guarantee criminal defendants the right to a fair trial in front of a fair and impartial judge. Then we have a citation to Poole v. State, 291 Georgia, 848-856-2012. So let's have a look at that citation. 
case text search case text search and let's have let's have a look at this so pool v state let's check his work pool v state and then we need to head down to page what is it uh, 856 All right, 856. A month before her murder trial, appellant signed a document in which she acknowledged having been advised of the judge's prior representation of her and her right to request another judge to preside over her trial. In the document, she stated her desire to have the judge continue to preside over her murder case. The document was signed by appellant and her trial counsel. Appellant now contends her express written waiver was insufficient, asserting that the trial court was required to question appellant about the waiver to ensure the waiver was knowing, intelligent, and voluntary. Such a judicial inquiry is necessary in order to ensure that the waiver of fundamental constitutional rights satisfy due, satisfies due process. And then we have a citation to a 1969 case, constitutional rights to trial by jury, confrontation of accusers, and, uh, and against compulsory self-incrimination. Uh, and then we have a 1994 case, effective assistance of counsel in, due rep in dual representation situations. There is no evidence. So he's citing, let me just go back to this. He's citing 856 uh, for the proposition that the 6th and 14th Amendments, the, the proposition that the 6th and 14th Amendments to the U.S. Constitution guarantee criminal defendants the right to a fair trial in front of a fair and impartial judge. Appellant argues the trial court erred aired uh, when it permitted the assistant district attorney to present new evidence during closing argument. Let's see. Here we go. So here's the proposition. Um, the issue of, let's see, there is no evidence that the trial judge's former representation of appellant affected her right to effective assistance of counsel in defending the murder charges and while a fair trial in a fair tribunal is a basic requirement of due process so just some legal commentary here and i'm not telling i'm not telling the attorney in georgia how to do his job but he's citing to a case pool v state here in georgia um, in which the outcome was unfavorable for the defendant, and he's making the proposition that the 6th and 14th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution guarantee criminal defendants the right to a fair trial in front of a fair and impartial judge. So just some legal commentary here. If I were citing the 6th and the, and the 14th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, number one, I might just cite the U.S. Constitution. But number two, if I were going to cite Poole v. State at page 856... I would use the parentheses here and say and put it in quotes while a fair and in a while a fair trial in a fair tribunal is a basic requirement of due process. So I would put that in parentheses and I'd put that in quotes. Um, and I would say specifically what line of that case, what part of that opinion I'm I'm citing. So, you know, notice that if I actually go and check his citations that that um, yes, that page does set, say that, but um, I would have I would have used a parenthetical. That's called a parenthetical. The due process clause guarantees a defendant a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct. Okay, so let's check that citation. All right, we have Whitmore v. State. Um, so I. This, he says Whitmore v. State, uh, seven, uh, 275 Georgia appellant. Let's see, 275. Yeah, so he miss. Uh, that's not the right name. It's, it's Whitworth. Okay, and then let's look at, let's go to page 796. So 
The Due Process Clause guarantees a defendant a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct. And then he misnames it Whitmore v. State. It's Whitworth v. State. And then let's go to page 796 and see if it supports that proposition. All right, and the proposition is the Due Process Clause guarantees a defendant a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct. All right, and the giving of advice on the plea proposal would, would appear to have been improper. Reversing Whitworth's conviction based on the trial court's failure to disqualify Morgan on these grounds, however, would be improper for two reasons. First, regarding the selection and briefing, briefing matters, no actual conflict of interest was shown. As previously noted, a prosecutor who is not a judicial officer is not held to as high a standard of independence and neutrality as a judge. The Supreme Court of Georgia has repeatedly held that, a, that an actual conflict of interest is required to warrant reversal for failure to disqualify. So we have an actual conflict of interest. A, a quote, theoretical or speculative conflict, end quote, is simply not sufficient. Here we go. And then the due process clause guarantees a defendant a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct. Second, because Whitworth alleges a factually specific claim of prosecutorial misconduct, quote the, and then in parentheticals here, the contact between the Attorney General's office and Morgan, Whitworth had to show actual misconduct and actual prejudice to his right to a fair trial in order to reverse his conviction. See also Lamb v. State, McGarvey v. State, and see also Smith v. Phillips. And then here we have a quote from Smith v. Phillips. So you're looking at a parenthetical here, and basically what I'm trying to say is that, you know, you should, uh, I think that Shannon Stillwell's attorney should have used the parenthetical. Uh, quote, the touchstone of due process analysis in cases of alleged prosecutorial misconduct is the fairness of the trial and not the culpability of the prosecutor. So does the Whitmore v. State broadly support the proposition that the due process clause guarantees a defendant a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct? Um, I'm looking at the citation. And it does cite to Smith v. Phillips. So if I were, you know, in the position, if I were in the position of Shannon Stillwell's attorney and I had the time to prepare, I'm not trying to insult Max Shart. I know Max Shart's a big, um, he's a crowd favorite. So I'm not trying to insult him. I'm giving you my opinions to be very clear. Um, if I were advising Max Shart and I were on his team, I am not, but were I on his team, I would say, listen, we should quote directly here this language from Smith v. Phillips, quote, the touchstone of due process analysis in cases of alleged prosecutorial misconduct is the fairness of the trial, not the culpability of the prosecutor. So I like that language, and I would actually steal that language, and I would quote it in my motion and say, we are not, we are not inculpating uh, prosecutors Love and Hilton. What we are doing is we are focusing on the unfair, the unfairness of the trial. So personally, I don't think that I would have cited to Whitmore v. State, uh, which that's not the right citation, it's Whitworth. Um, and I would, I would use this language from Smith v. Phillips. So I'm just looking at his citation here, and um, it doesn't, you know, both of his citations are unfortunately coming from language in cases in which the out the desired outcome was not reached but that's fine you can you can use cases in which your desired outcome was not reached but if you do you need to be careful and you know he's not using like a citation here i would say c pool v state c for example pool v state and c whitworth v state and the reason i would do that is because the cases which he cited do not directly support the proposition that he is putting in his motion. And I want to see these defendants out on bond. I want to see this trial declared as a mistrial. I do think that there have been serious due process violations here. And I think in order for these motions to be as persuasive as possible, the citation should be on point and the case law cited should be 
used in such a manner that it's most persuasive. Okay, number uh, here we have number three. Mr. Stilwell and his co-defendants have been in trial for approximately 19 months. Approximately 75 witnesses have testified so far. Mr. Stilwell has remained in jail for the duration of this trial. Number four, Judge Ural Glanville was the original trial judge in this case. Judge Glanville was recused from this case by an order signed by the Honorable Judge Kraus, uh, Kraus on July 15, 2024. Then we have Mr. Stilwell's rights. The state is seeking a, quote, life without parole sentence for Mr. Stilwell if he is wrong, uh, wrongly convicted. I would use wrongfully instead of wrongly, but that's just my opinion. Mr. Stilwell demands that his trial be conducted in a fair and constitutional manner. Prosecutorial misconduct implicates a, def a criminal defendant's due process rights when it renders a trial uh, un unfair and violates the defendant's right to a fair trial. So here again, we see a citation to the same case that we just read on the same page. So prosecutorial, what's the proposition? What's the argument? The argument is prosecutorial misconduct implicates a criminal defendant's due process rights when it renders, so we have a typo here, when it renders a trial unfair and violates the defendant's rights to a fair trial. So again, let's have a look at what the prop, the, that, that page actually says. Um, so this is about conflicts of interest. And we're on, we're on the, that case. We're on page 796. Second, because Whitworth alleges a factually specific claim of prosecutorial misconduct, the contact between the Attorney General's office and Morgan, Whitworth had to show actual misconduct and actual prejudice to his right to a fair trial in order to reverse his conviction. And then here we see a quote from Smith v. Phillips, quote, the touchstone of due process analysis in cases of alleged prosecutorial misconduct is the fairness of the trial, not the culpability of the prosecutor. So if I were Max Shart or I were advising Max Shart on his case law research, I would advise him to, to, have, to have used Smith v. Phillips. Okay, and then here we have the, he used a second case here, Serdula v. State, 344 Georgia Pellet 587 590. Serdula v. State. Okay, and then what's he? He's at page 590. It's a 2018 case. I need the 2018 case. Sir Dula v. State, that's the 2018 case. Okay. And I want... Uh, what, what's he citing? Page 590? This should be Georgia Appellate. 812 Southeast 2nd. Georgia Court Appellate. That's 2018. I'm not seeing page 90. Okay, I'm going to leave that one alone. Oh, he's actually quoting it here. Okay, no, here we have a here we have a um, a quote. Judicial integrity, and you can see this is copy pasted because it's a different size font. Judicial integrity is a state interest of the highest order because the power and prerogative of a court to resolve disputes rests upon the respect accorded by citizens to a court's judgments, which in turn depend on the issuing court's absolute probity. That's Mayor and Alderman of Savannah v. Batson Cook Co. That's a 290, um, a 291 Georgia Appellate 114 at 114. So... What I like about this citation is that he's just directly quoting it, and it's language that supports his argument, and it's, an, and it's a direct quote. So, personally, I don't think that your motions should be always too many direct quotes, but when you have a, 
a quote or language from an opinion that absolutely supports what you're, it's absolutely good law and it's absolutely on point for what you're saying. It's a good art. It's good to just copy and paste that right in there. Just steal it and put it, just put it right in there into your motion. Um, so with that being said, um, I like, I like that quote a lot. Now, when you are, you know, I don't like these, the, some of the citations, the Whitworth v. State. I don't like that one in Poole v. State. And the reason why I'm not as much of a fan is because, because those cases had adverse outcomes, number one. And then the language on the page that he's citing, to which he is citing, does not really directly support what he's trying to say. It's tangentially supportive. Um, if I were advising uh, Mr. Shart, Attorney Shart, on using those two cases, I would say make sure to use a parenthetical and explain which part of that page you're, you're pointing to. Okay? To the extent this trial has failed to meet these constitutional requirements in the past, Mr. Stilwell demands that this court take appropriate actions. While Mr. Stilwell is confident that the court will endeavor to ensure him a fair trial, a fair trial moving forward from the current trial judge, this does not cure the constitutional errors and, and the resulting harm to Mr. Stilwell, which has already occur, uh, occurred. And then here we have on page three, readily apparent examples of error, impropriety, prosecutorial misconduct, and judicial partiality. This case has been plagued by discovery violations, lost and missing police reports, and Brady violations. Now, Brady is obviously the number one case to cite that when, when the state, the state must turn over all of its evidence tending to prove innocence in a criminal case. And nevertheless, I would still look up Brady and I would, I would cite to the part of Brady that you're actually citing to. Okay, number seven, as detailed in depth in co-defendant Williams, July 10th, 2024, quote, motion for a fair trial, the prosecutors of this case have repeated, have repeatedly, all right, repeatedly failed to show the orders of the court, have made specious allegations against uh, defense counsel, and have lacked candor to the court. So I'm going to show you guys uh, what specious means. I have a feeling that many of y'all don't know what specious means, which is fine. So specious, specious. If y'all are wondering, what are specious alleg allegations? I'm going to get it defined for you. No? Can't get, I cannot get Black's Law Dictionary to load? Okay, then we're just going to go with Merriam-Webster. Specious. So, specious uh, means having a false look of truth or genuineness. So, that's what it means. Or Definition number two, having deceptive attraction or allure or obsolete showy. Specious comes from Latin uh, speciosus, meaning, quote, beautiful or, quote, plausible. And Middle English speech speakers used it to mean, quote, visually pleasing. In time, specious had begun to suggest an attractiveness that was superficial or deceptive, and subsequently the words neutral, quote, pleasing sense faded into obsolescence. So specious means, uh, like what this says, having a false look of truth or genuineness. So, as detailed in depth in co-defendant's motion, the prosecutors of this case have repeatedly failed to follow the orders of the court, have made specious allegations allegations against defense counsel and have lacked candor to the court. That's number seven. Paragraph number eight. This case has been plagued by improper rulings, uh, including but not limited to an overly liberal and unconstitutional application of, of OCGA 801 D2E. Defense counsel has routinely been cut off by the prior trial judge when arguing these matters and rulings have been made with little or no analysis. So uh, here at this channel in Law by Reese, uh, we are not going to <laughs> lack, lack, uh, my autism requires that we must, in fact, perform our analysis. So we're going to look at OCGA 801 uh, D2E.
uh, OCGA. All right, here we go. Uh, I need it. All right, we'll do a general search. Georgia code eight oh one D two E. Evidence, Rule 801-D2E, co-conspirator statements. So, 801-D2E... Georgia Code, Section 24. Okay. So, the, I guess the reason why I'm, I'm, do you see how this says OCGA 801, uh, uh, paren D, two, paren E, that's, the reason why I'm having trouble searching this is that's actually the citation to the Federal Rules of Evidence. Rule 801, definitions that apply to this article and exclusion from hearsay. So this is actually quoting, he, he cited, he wrote out OCGA, but then he cited the federal, the federal rules of evidence, which Georgia probably wholesale adopted the federal rules of evidence, but that's why I'm, I'm having trouble with it. Rule 801, definitions that apply to this article, exclusions from hearsay. The following definitions apply under this article. So here we have 801 and then D, statements that are not hearsay. A statement that meets the following conditions is not hearsay. So then we need number two. An opposing party statement. The statement is offered against an opposing party and E. Was made by the party's co-conspirator co during and in furtherance of the conspiracy. So that's what the citation there is. So this case has been plagued by improper legal rulings, including but not limited to an overly liberal and unconstitutional application of that shouldn't say OCGA, that's really FRE, 801D2E, which are co-conspirator co statements. Defense counsel has routinely been cut off by the prior trial judge when these matters and rulings have been made with little or no analysis. All right, and then number nine. This case has also been exceptional in the treatment, actually mistreatment, of defendants and defense counsel. Examples include, but are not limited to, per in A, an incident which occurred on or about October 2, 2023, when Judge Glanville initiated a contempt hearing against undersigned counsel Max Shart, attorney for Mr. Stillwell. And then Perrin 1, counsel is solely concerned with his client, Mr. Stillwell, and not himself. Nonetheless, the treatment of defense counsel in this case is evidence of Judge Glanville's lack of impartiality throughout this case, which violates Mr. Stillwell's constitutional rights. On this date, Judge Glanville sent deputies to find undersigned counsel during the court's lunch break and summoned undersigned counsel to chambers. A courtroom de deputy informed undersigned counsel that Judge Glanville was expecting an apology from counsel for calling him some bull uh, bullshit in open court. While in chambers, undersigned counsel was that he should not deny the accusations as it was all captured on video. And then parent, uh, we have footnote three. Obviously, this was not an effective interrogation technique as undersigned counsel knew that he did not commit said act and would not have been shown on the, the courtroom video doing so. When undersigned counsel refused to apologize for something he did not do, Judge Glanville tersely instructed counsel to leave his chambers. Later in the day, Judge Glanville initiated a contempt hearing against undersigned counsel. Judge Glanville berated counsel and threatened incarceration. Judge Glanville accused undersigned counsel of violating bar rules and putting his law license in jeopardy for lying to the tribunal and not confessing his sins. And then here we have uh, 
footnote number four. The reality is that the court was demanding that undersigned counsel lie to the tribunal by falsely confessing to something that he did not do. In the end, uh, the attorney David Botts, who was seated within feet of undersigned counsel at the time, spoke up and stated that undersigned counsel never made such statement. Uh, Of course, the video that, quote, captured the event was never produced and no apology was made. Sub B. Judge Glanville has repeatedly demanded that certain defense counsels, including but not limited to undersigned counsel, attorney Brian Steele and attorney Kerton Matthews, to, quote, sit down in a terse and and abrupt manner when overruling valid objections, all uh, all in front of the jury. These incidents have been too numerous to document individually. Uh, Sub C. Judge Glanville has sustained specious and frivolous vagueness and facts not in evidence arguments from the state that have effectively cut off the the defense's ability to conduct a thorough and sifting cross-examination. Just one example of this can be found by viewing undersigned counsel's attempts to effectively cross-examine investigator Tyrone Dennis. Sub D. Judge Glanville, on two different occasions, baselessly called attorney Brian Steele unprofessional and unprepared in front of the sitting jury. When it was shown that Judge Glanville's comments were completely off base, Judge Glanville refused a defense request to issue an instruction that the jurors should disregard his comments about attorney Steele. Uh, Sub E, Judge Glanville has monitored the movements of defense counsel, including undersigned counsel, throughout the courthouse through security cameras for no permissible purpose and without cause. The state has repeatedly demanded reciprocal discovery from the defense without any legal uh, bases and has uh, repeatedly misstated the law covering reciprocal discovery, all to obtain an unfair advantage from Judge Glanville. The state has gone so far as to conduct non-attorney contact, non-attorney members of the defense team and demand that they provide certain items to the state without consulting with defense counsel first. These actions were taken without any legal basis and were uh, attempts to unconstitutionally invade the attorney-client privilege and the duty of confidentiality of the defense. G, the state intentionally and erroneously accused Attorney Steele of tampering, tampering with and altering jail calls made by Kenneth Copeland, which were served in reciprocal discovery. Of course, these heavy accusations were entirely false and without merit. There were no consequences for making these wild, false claims. On June 10, 2024, Judge Glanville held an illegal contempt hearing against Attorney Brian Steele. Judge Glanville briefly incarcerated Mr. Steele and attempted to sentence him to 20 days in jail. Judge Glanville uh, deprived Attorney Steele of due process and the assistance of counsel. Number 10, the defense, after repeated requests, has finally been provided with the state's June 7, 2024, ex parte motion for order to compel testimony necessary to the public interest. This motion, submitted by elected District Attorney Fannie Willis and Chief Deputy District Attorney Adrian Love, here and after Love, contains, upon information and belief, a glaring misrepresentation. In paragraph 11 of this motion, the, the state asserts that after an, ac- an encounter with uh, defense team members, Copeland informed representatives of the district attorney's office that he, quote, may attempt to plead the fifth in order to avoid testifying against members of YSL. The motion does not provide any information regarding the specifics of this alleged encounter or uh, which defense team members were allegedly involved. Upon information and belief, after reaching out to defense counsels involved in the case, this information is completely false. Upon information and belief, no members of any defense team had any contact with Kenneth Copeland on or about June 6, 2024. It goes without saying, upon information and belief, no defense counsel or members of any defense team ever interacted with Kenneth Copeland in any way that would dissuade him from testifying. This false and disparaging information about defense counsel was provided to Judge Glanville in an ex parte motion. So guys, I want to uh, define what ex parte means for y'all if you briefly don't know. Ex parte means on or for one side or or party only used uh, in legal proceedings. Or number two, from a one-sided or partisan point of view. So it's uh, meaning one one side or party only used in legal proceedings. Okay, 
Uh, all right, guys, so we're going to take a quick break here, quick pause, and be back momentarily. Welcome back, guys. This is Law by Reese here. Starting with the June 10th, 2024 ex parte meeting, we are on paragraph 11. <clears throat> Quote, Except as authorized by law or by rule, judges shall neither initiate nor consider ex parte communications by interested parties or their attorneys concerning a pending or impending proceeding. Uniform Superior Court Rule 4.1. Ex parte hearings are only authorized in the case of extraordinary matters such as restraining orders and temporary injunctions. In other judicial hearings, both parties should be notified of the hearing with an opportunity of any objection that might be properly registered. And here we have City of Pendergrass v. Skelton, 2006, citing Anderson v. So we have some citations here. Ex parte communications are presumed to have been an error. Uh, City of Pendergrass citing to Arnal v. Arnal. So that's a, a family law or divorce case. Additionally, the Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.9, instructs judges to generally avert. So, uh, just so you guys know what avert means. Avert. To turn away or aside. The eyes, one's gaze, etc. In avoidance. So, avert ex parte communications to assure fair hearings. Rule 2.9 generally permits ex parte communications subject to a narrow exception for, quote, uh, scheduling administrative purposes or emergencies that do not deal with substantive matters or issues on the merits, provided that A, <clears throat> the judge reasonably believes that no party will gain a procedural, substantive, or tactical advantage as a result of the ex parte communication, and B, the judge makes provisions promptly to notify all other parties of the substance of the ex parte communication and gives the parties an opportunity to, to respond. Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.9, Cap A1. 12. On June 10, 2024, while the defendants and defense attorneys were all in the trial courtroom waiting for, for court to start, Judge Glanville, Love, and or Fulton County Deputy District Attorney Simone Hilton, as well as witness Kenneth Copeland and his attorney, Kayla Bumpus, all met ex parte upon in information and belief. A quick comment on that, guys. The reason why... Uh, that you say information and belief is exactly for that. You don't exactly know, and it's a way of sort of covering your ass or CYA. So uh, I don't think that it's always necessary to use upon information and belief, but if you're trying to be extra careful and not put yourself in a position that you cannot readily defend uh, later, using uh, upon information and belief is, is one way that you can do that. Neither Copeland nor his attorney requested this meeting. In fact, <clears throat> Neither Copeland nor Bumpus ever expressed any concerns which would have prompted anyone to consider such a meeting at all appropriate. 13. While the state falsely characterizes this meeting as merely a discussion about Copeland's grant of immunity pursuant to OCGA Section 245507, uh, the reality is that Copeland had already been granted derivative use immunity on June 7, 2024. So let's have a look at OCGA 24507. Grant of immunity. So here we go. So we can see here, whenever in the judgment of the attorney general or any district attorney, the testimony of any person or the production of evidence of any kind by any person in any criminal proceeding before a court or grand jury is necessary to the public interest, the Attorney General may request in writing the Superior Court to order such person to testify or produce the evidence. Upon order of the court, such person shall not be excused on the basis of the privilege against self-incrimination from testifying or produce, producing any evidence required. But no testimony or other evidence required under the order or any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or evidence shall be used against the person in any proceeding or prosecution for a crime or offense concerning which, or, concerning which he or she testified or produced evidence under court order. However, okay, and then we have the perjury. Um, it, so going down to sub B here. So the, the key language of that is it, number one it has to be in the public interest 
Number two, um, the district attorney, you have to get a court order for it and, and brought by the prosecution in a criminal proceeding. And then number three, um, any information directly or indirectly derived from such testimony or evidence shall be used against the person in any proceeding or prosecution for a crime or offense concerning which he or she testified or produced evidence under court order. So basically that is your derivative. That's a state statute which is describing derivative use immunity. So it has to be in the public interest. It has to be in a criminal proceeding. Uh, it has to be advised by the attorney general and ordered by the court. And then here we go, uh, contempt. B, if a person refuses to testify after being granted immunity from prosecution and after being ordered to testify as set forth in this code section, such person may be a judge in contempt and committed to the county jail un such, until such time as such person purges himself or herself of contempt by testifying as ordered without regard to the expiration of the grand jury. If the grand jury, so the grand jury is not the petite jury in which, so don't worry about the grand jury for purposes of Kenneth Copeland. Uh, that's just the grand jury that brings the indictment. Um, basically, guys, so what this is is that, that if Kenneth Copeland refuses to testify, they can hold him in contempt. Okay. There was nothing else for the parties to discuss regarding the grant of immunity. Copeland never requested to meet with the prosecution and the trial judge to discuss these matters. Additionally, the ex parte communications were about more than Copeland's previously granted immunity. Judge Glanville and the prosecutors discussed Copeland's proposed testimony and provided legal advice, albeit incorrect legal advice, and strategy to Copeland. Throughout this process, Judge Glanville was clearly working in concert with the state and abandoned any semblance of impartiality. All right, guys, uh, in case y'all don't know what semblance means, semblance, an out outward and often specious appearance or show, aspect, countenance, a phantasmal form, uh, actual or apparent resemblance. So here's uh, section number four here. Actual or apparent resemblance is the most accurate definition. Paragraph 14, uh, or section 14, neither Judge Glanville nor the state revealed that these ex parte communications had occurred to the defendants or defense counsel who were waiting for hours in the courtroom, complete, completely oblivious to what was occurring behind closed doors. Judge Glanville's silence violated Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct 2.9 Cap A1 Sub B. 15. The defense would likely not know of these communications and their substance if not for attorney Brian Steele, who learned of the meeting by happenstance and confronted the court, bringing sunlight to darkness. I like that phrase there, bringing sunlight to darkness. 16. When attorney Steele inquired about the secret June 10, 2024 meeting, Judge Glanville immediately sought to hold attorney Brian Steele in contempt of court. Judge Glanville attempted to incarcerate attorney Steele for 20 days for refusing to reveal how he learned about these illegal ex parte communications. Judge Glanville had deputies take attorney Steele into custody and attempted to incarcerate attorney Steele without notice or legal counsel. 17. As the existence of the ex parte meeting became known, Judge Glanville frustrated undersigned counsel's attempt to learn more about this meeting. Uh, Judge Glanville claimed that what occurred in the secret meeting in his counsel was, was privileged. This claim of privilege was without merit. I like that. It's a strong, punchy. I like these little, short, punchy sentences. Uh, that's pretty good. I like it. 18. Judge Glanville, it appears, instigated some sort of investigation into this incident. The focus of this investigation was not on the impropriety of the illegal meeting, which would be investigating himself, which he's not going to do, but rather on how Attorney Steele and other members of the defense learned about it. This investigation included Judge Glanville utilizing law enforcement resources to access courthouse cameras to track the movements of Attorney Steele and undersigned counsel through the courthouse on June 10, 2024. 19. As public pressure mounted, a transcript of the meeting was eventually provided to the defense. The transcript of the meeting speaks for itself and is shocking. The transcript reveals that A, neither Love, Hilton, nor Judge Glanville had a legitimate basis to engage in ex parte communications. B, the ex parte meeting was not requested by Copeland or his attorney. C, the prosecutor, specifically Love, misrepresented facts and made specious allegations against attorney John Melnick. Undersigned counsel and attorney Steele 
to Judge Glanville. Uh, and then we have footnote number five. Uh, sub D, the prosecutors and Judge Glanville incorrectly advised Copeland about the law of derivative use immunity and applicable statute of limitations, and all in an attempt to coerce Copeland to testify. And then let's read uh, footnote number six here. The state claimed and Judge Glanville ratified that Copeland faces no legal jeopardy in this case by advising Copeland that the statute of limitations has run. It is unclear how the state and the trial judge came to this conclusion. First, this conclusion ignores the tolling provisions of the statute of limitations in Georgia. Second, even for older incidents, their legal analysis uh, in, in, is interesting in light of the case that they are currently prosecuting and would be interesting to the six defendants at trial, those individuals who have entered pleas to this indictment and those who continue to languish in jail awaiting trial on this indictment as they are charged under a RICO count that includes cases dating back to January 25th, 2013. Okay. Uh, sub E, the prosecutors and Judge Glanville incorrectly advised Copeland that he could be held in civil contempt indefinitely if he failed to testify, all in an attempt to coerce Mr. Copeland to testify. F. Judge Glanville abandoned any semblance of neutrality and worked in concert with the prosecution by advising Mr. Copeland and Copeland's attorney about legal matters, all to cause Copeland to testify. Judge Glanville assisted the prosecution in the preparation uh, of Mr. Copeland as a state's witness, instructing that a list of questions prepared by the state be provided to him. H. A significant amount of Brady material poured out in this meeting but the same was poured out in this meeting, but the same was hidden from the defense. Neither the existence of this meeting nor this Brady material was revealed to the defense until the transcript was finally released. The June 7, 2024, ex parte meeting. On July 30, 2024, the Honorable Judge Whitaker presided over substantive matters of this case for the first time. The Honorable Judge Whitaker provided much-needed clarity to the defense by releasing the rough draft of a transcript of additional ex parte communications between the prosecution and Judge Glanville. This ex parte meeting occurred on June 7, 2024, and included Love, Hilton, and Judge Glanville. These communications and the substance thereof had never been disclosed to the defense until the Honorable Judge Whitaker released the transcript. Neither Judge Glanville nor the state ever made any disclosures regarding these communications, even as Attorney Steele pulled the curtain on the July 10, 2024 meeting. Instead, Judge Glanville and the state uh, remained silent on this topic, missing a comma. Additionally, uh, while the parties were well aware that the Honorable Judge Krause was, uh, Krause was considering the uh, advisability and potential implications of the June 10, 2017, uh, ex parte, as part of her consideration of motions filed to recuse Judge Glanville, upon information and belief, neither the prose prosecutors nor Judge Glanville ever revealed to, ju to Judge Krause that there was, in fact, another ex parte, ex parte meeting that had occurred three days prior. This was their secret. 21. The transcript of the June 7, 2024 communications is shocking. It also sheds light on how this case has become irretrievably broken. It's part of the argument to support a mistrial. As an initial matter, there is no stated justification for the ex parte communications. The meeting was initiated by the state. Neither Copeland nor his counsel had requested that the state meet in private with Judge Glanville. The meeting itself was illegal. 22. The state in this meeting intentionally and wrongly attacked the character of, Cop of Copeland's attorney, Melnick, claiming that Melnick was not representing Copeland's interests. The prosecutors besmirched uh, Melnick and to Judge Glanville without cause, all because Copeland was not interacting with the prosecutors in a manner that they would have preferred. The prosecutors claimed to be the only ones who were truly representing the interests of, our, of quote, our witness. The prosecutors comp complained that they had been having productive communications with Copeland outside the presence of Melnick before Melnick had, quote, inserted himself in his client's legal affairs. The prosecutor's claims that Melnick was not representing Copeless Copeland's interests is rich. And 
As they were communicating with the person behind Melnick's back, the state had intended to call Mr. Copeland as a witness without granting him any sort of legal protection as a witness. It was only after Melnick, in, quote, inserted himself and advocated for his client that the state sought to grant Copeland derivative use immunity. The irony does not end there. The state, in this meeting, claimed to be concerned about the possibility of Copeland suffering an unjust jail sentence due to Melnick's interference in his client's affairs. At no time, however, did the, sa the, st the state ever seek any non-custodial alternatives for Copeland should Judge Glanville hold him in contempt. Instead, these prosecutors insisted on an indefinite incarceration for civil contempt, which would have been illegal. The state also questioned Melnick's devotion to his client as Mr. Melnick was planning to leave the state on vacation while his client was incarcerated for contempt. The state complained to Judge Glanville that Melnick, that Melnick had not planned his vacation around Copeland's testimony. This is a ridiculous accusation as the state intentionally failed to communicate with Melnick and had not given Melnick any notice that they were planning to call his client to testify on June 7th, 2024. The state was clearly only concerned with Copeland's interests as long as they were directly aligned with their own interests, meaning the state's interests. The state feigned interest in Copeland's well-being to get a foot in the door to Judge Glanville's chambers, all in an attempt to initiate improper ex parte communications. 23. Melnick was not the only attorney who was disparaged by the state and Judge Glanville in this secret June 7, 2024 meeting. Love claimed that she was Love being the uh, deputy district attorney. Love claimed that she was in receipt of an email from Melnick sent to her and Hilton, but also that other individuals had been blind copied on the communication. The clear instruction from the conversation is that it was Attorney Steele and undersigned counsel who were, quote, blind copied. Undersigned counsel does not make blind accusations, but neither undersigned counsel nor Attorney Steele were, quote, blind copied on any email between Love and Melnick. Later in the ex parte meeting, Love again brings up Attorney Steele and undersigned counsel, noting that we were included on a June 6, 2024 email from Melnick. Love and Hilton were also included on this email, in which Melnick expressed his client's decision to exercise his Fifth Amendment rights if called to testify by the state. It is unknown why, why Love feels that she should have a monopoly on information or why she feels that <laughs> that's, that's a pretty strong statement there. Um, why she feels that defense attorneys should not be included on discussions concerning these matters. Undersigned counsel would like to inquire about these matters with love, sworn in as a witness. Judge Glanville abandons any impartiality and echoes, echoes love's thought, asking, why would he, meaning Melnick, uh, have done that given before ADA Hilton responds, and that's the state's concern. Love then affirms, that's the point. Rough transcript, page 8. As Judge Glanville had questions, so do I. Undersigned counsel ask, asks why my inclusion on this simple email communication was of concern to the court. Love then assures Judge Glanville that she is looking for a remedy for this materially false and made-up situation, as if one exists, and tells Judge Glanville that she will contact him when she finds a solution, either over the weekend or on the coming Monday, presumably through additional ex parte communications. Wow. Before wrapping up the illegal and unethical meeting, that's some strong language there, Judge Glanville refers to outside agitators affecting the trial, stating, I mean, but I see it from just being in the courtroom and tracking. Judge Glanville's concern and inherent skepticism of email communications between Melnick, Attorney Steele, and undersigned counsel exemplifies Judge Glanville's bias and partiality towards the state. The, trans the transcripts of both the June 7th, 
2024 and June 10th, 2024 ex parte meetings show Judge Glanville's clear bias, bias against Attorney Steele and undersigned counsel and finally provide an explanation, albeit an unacceptable one, for Judge Glanville's treatment of the defendants and their counsel throughout this trial. The illegality of the ex parte meetings now known to the defense. We now know that two ex parte meetings have, have occurred. These ex parte uh, meetings were clearly illegal and improper. The state relies on Kings v, King v. State 273, Georgia 258, 2000 in a specious attempt to argue that these ex parte meetings were proper. The, state, the state's reliance on King is misplaced for several reasons. First, in King, the state met with the court to provide information that would allow the court to make a judicial determination as to whether, whether the anticipated testimony of the witness was, quote, necessary to the public interest under OCGA section 245507, as is required under the law. In this case, Judge Glanville had already conveyed derivative use immunity to Copeland earlier on June 7, 2024, presumably in a third, albeit first time, first in time ex parte meeting. So guys, um, what the argument here is, is that because Judge Glanville had already conveyed derivative, immuse, immu derivative use immunity to Copeland, there was no other justification uh, for the ex parte meeting. In addition to that, guys, uh, this is a basic legal tactic of, or legal writing or advocacy of distinguishing your case's facts from the case upon which the opposing side is relying. So the opposing side is going to rely on some proposition of law to advance its argument, and you need to uh, distinguish your case's facts from the proposition that the other side is offering. So you can see that he's distinguishing this case from King. Second, in King, the defense never alleged that they were not informed of the substance of the ex parte meeting in a timely manner. In our case, purposely, uh, the state purposely hid this illegal and unethical conf conference from the defense. So again, more, this is more distinction from the, the, the case upon which the state is relying. The fact that, that this meeting occurred, these meetings occurred, much less their substance, was only revealed to the doggedness of the defense and sheer happenstance. Third, while the subject matter was limited to the, quote, necessary to the public interest requirement of OCGA Section 25507 in King, the subject matter of the June 7th and June 10th ex parte meetings included much more, including specious and knowingly false allegations made against defense counsel and by relation, the defendants themselves. So again, uh, this is really good advocacy from Max Shart in undermining and distinguishing the case in this uh, in this instance, King v. State, and and you can see first, second, and third. These are the three ways that I'm distinguishing this case from the case uh, upon which the state is relying. And so this this is good advocacy here. I like this a lot. These improper ex parte meetings are the result of both grave prosecutorial and judicial misconduct. These meetings were never requested by Cop Copeland, Bumpus, or Melnick. Instead, they were all initiated by the state and welcomed by Judge Glanville. These meetings, when considered with other previously discussed actions of the prosecutors and Judge Glanville in this case, violated Mr. Stilwell's constitutional rights to due process and a fair trial. These meetings, especially when, in, when considered in addition to Judge Glanville's other actions throughout this trial, have also violated Mr. Stilwell's right to a fair trial in front of an impartial judge. The transcripts of these meetings reveal that Judge Glanville, perhaps based on inaccurate and misleading information pr provided to him by the prosecutors through ex parte communications, always looked at Attorney Steele and undersigned counsel, as well as our respective clients, with suspicion which is against the presumption of innocence. Judge Glanville, in meeting with, consulting with, working with, and planning with the prosecutors, clearly abandoned any semblance of impartiality. So he keeps repeating that theme, abandoning semblances of impartiality. He's, he's stated that uh, three times. 
Both of these meetings occurred during critical stages in this trial, which goes to Sixth Amendment, a line of cases involving the Sixth Amendment. Uh, Mr. Stilwell had a constitutional right to be present. See Article 1, Section 1, Paragraph 12 of the Georgia Constitution and the corresponding section of the United States Constitution. Also see Scrutter v. State, 298 Georgia, uh, 438, 440. So let's check, his, let's check his work here. Let's check this case. Scudder v. State. And then what do we need to... We're looking at page 440. So let's read page 440. Scudder correctly asserts that a criminal defendant has the right to be present and to see and hear all critical parts of his trial. This is a fundamental right and a foundational aspect of due process of law. It is a right that may be relinquished, however, if the defendant personally waives it in court, if counsel waives it at the defendant's express uh, direction, if counsel waives it in open court while the defendant is present, or if counsel waives it and the defendant subsequently uh, acquiesces in the waiver. So the proposition here is that Mr. Stilwell had a constitutional right to be present. And then looking at uh, page 440, Scudder correctly asserts that a criminal defendant has the right to be present to s and to see and hear all, quote, critical parts of his trial. This is a, quote, fundamental right and a foundational aspect of due process of law. So the argument there is that these ex parte meetings were a, quote, critical part of this trial. All right. And because his client and himself, meaning, uh, the client and the attorney, the defense counsel, Max Sharp, were not allowed to be present at the ex parte meeting, and the ex parte meeting was a, quote, critical part of the trial, then his due process rights have been violated. So it hinges on whether that ex parte meeting was was a, quote, critical part of his trial or not quit a, a critical part of his trial. So just wanted to check, his, check on that citation. As Mr. Stilwell nor his counsel were permitted to attend these meetings, Mr. Stilwell's Sixth and Fourteenth Amendment rights of the United States Constitution, as well as Article I, Section 1, Paragraph 12 of the Georgia Constitution, were violated. This is a structural error which will demand reversal should Mr. Stilwell be wrongly convicted of any counts in this indictment. So let's go U.S. Constitution, Sixth Amendment. All right, here we, here we have it. Sixth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses ag against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Okay, guys, remedies, and then we're on the last couple pages here. Paragraph 28. Mr. Stilwell has been harmed by judicial misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct. I, you know, before I, before I go on, I just want to mention that, uh, so here, we see both of these meetings occurred during critical stages, occurred during critical stages in the trial. And then you can see the language here is critical parts of his trial. I would have used, if you're, gonna, if you're going to cite Scudder v. State, I would have ripped the term part instead of, so you see how it says uh, critical parts of this trial, and this comes from an earlier Georgia case. Um, I would have used parts instead of stages. So I would have used critical parts of this trial. All right. And then I would have reworded this slightly, and I would have said because both of these meetings occurred during critical parts of Mr. Stilwell's trial. So that's how I would have started it. Uh, Mr. Stilwell had a constitutional right to be present. So I think if you're going to rip language here from, from Scudder, I would have used the term part instead of stage, and then I would have said this sentence instead. Because both of these meetings occurred during critical stages in this trial, comma, Mr. Stilwell had a constitutional right to be present. And then I don't know if I would have there's not necessarily more persuasiveness in having more citations. Just rip the language from the case that you want. You don't need to necessarily string cite. 
string citations are not necessarily or inherently more persuasive than just citing to to the case law that you that you're wanting. Mr. Stilwell has been harmed by judicial misconduct, prosecutorial misconduct, and other error in this case. Focusing solely on the ex parte communications, the prosecutors and the trial judge teamed up to coerce and in, that's strong language teamed up to coerce and intimidate Copeland to change his mind and testify for the state. Copeland's testimony was harmful in itself, but does more than that. As a result of this coercion and intimidation, the state has and plans to continue to impeach Copeland with his prior inconsistent statements, essentially playing several videos of Copeland's out-of-court statements, which are harmful and prejudicial to Mr. Stilwell and others. These out-of-court statements involve several of the charged events and counts in this indictment and are central to count two of this indictment, which alleges that Mr. Stilwell committed the murder of Donovan Thomas. 29. Mr. Stilwell does not wish to demand a mistrial, absent a finding of goading, and thus jeopardy attaching. Mr. Stilwell has been incarcerated throughout the duration of this case. He has been viciously attacked while incarcerated. He almost lost his life. Starting trial all over again is not a viable option for Mr. Stilwell. Despite the persistent legal errors, the illegal actions taken by the prosecutors and the previous trial judge, and the damage inflicted by the presentation of Copeland's prior untruthful out-of-court statements, the defense is winning. I like that. Additionally, this trial is already tainted by structural errors. Mr. Stilwell does not wish to submit to the desires of the state and Judge Glanville, who have attempted to goad Mr. Stilwell into moving for a mistrial. Mr. Stilwell does not want this case to start all over. 30. Nonetheless, serious errors have tainted this trial. It is unacceptable that Mr. Stilwell must accept that, for, that the first several months of, of his trial have been tainted by prosecutorial and judicial misconduct, illegal ex parte meetings, and a partial judge. It is unacceptable that Copeland's out-of-court statements, which are arguably admissible as a result of the previously discussed illegal ex parte meetings, may be played for the jury. It is also unacceptable that the previous rulings of a partial, partial judge should continue to guide this case. Judge Glanville's hostility towards and suspicion of undersigned counsel has likely created a lasting impression on the jury, who surely view a trial judge as a person in authority. Carrying on with this trial as if nothing improper has occurred is not an acceptable option. 31. The structural errors and other legal reversible errors in this case must be considered in the context of how they occurred. All of these errors have been caused by the, prosec by the prosecution and Judge Glanville. Neither Mr. Stilwell, undersigned counsel, nor any co-defendants or their counsel have caused or invited any of these issues. Hilton is a seasoned prosecutor of nearly 15 years who holds the title of Deputy District Attorney in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Per the District Attorney's website, she helps lead the Special Victims Division. She has, been rece she has received many awards with the District Attorney's Office and has also taught trial technique classes at Emory University School of Law. Love is an attorney with almost 20 years of litigation experience almost exclusively as a prosecutor. Attorney Love is a chief deputy district attorney of high, high profile cases and difficult witnesses division within the Fulton County District Attorney's Office and is part of that office's executive team. She leads a division in the largest uh, district attorney's office in the state, one that is dedicated to cases involving difficult witnesses. The Georgia Court of Appeals have, has noted that state prosecutors are generally knowledgeable and well-trained too knowledgeable and well-trained not to know the consequences of basic rules of prosecutorial procedure and conduct. And then here, here we have Wilson v. State 233, Georgia Appellate 327, uh, and he doesn't have a pinpoint citation. I'm just going to have to take his word for it that Wilson v. State broadly um, supports that proposition. Pros prosecutors as recognized and experienced as Hilton and Love should certainly be held to this minimal bar, if not, if not much higher. Surely Hilton and Love, with their knowledge and experience, knew of the impropriety of these ex parte communications. 
Their experience told them something else, however. Based on their knowledge of the law of impeachment and prior inconsistent statements, the prosecutors knew that if Copeland did not testify and remained in jail, even a partial judge would be hard-pressed to allow the jurors to hear multiple hours of Copeland's recorded statements. The ex parte meeting was a calculated risk for the prosecutors. So guys, basically, what is the, if you don't know the law behind this, you can, somebody lies on the stand or tells a mistruth on the stand, you can impeach that witness witness's testimony by providing evidence of a prior inconsistent statement. And so if Copeland was not offered, in this case, if Copeland were not offered immunity, they could not bring in hours of Copeland's recorded statements, which the state really is concerned about getting in. And the only way that they can get those in is if Copeland testifies and Copeland does not exactly tell the whole truth, which they knew that Copeland was going to lie. They knew that Copeland had admitted to being a liar. And so they can bring in all of these statements for the jury to hear. And that, that's why basically what Max Chart is saying, that's the, that's, the, that's the motive right there for this ex parte, this ex parte meeting. The ex parte meeting was a calculated risk for the prosecutors. Either Copeland would be intimidated and coerced into testifying, or the illegal ex parte communications would be grounds for a mistrial and the state would have time to regroup and begin anew. Judge Glanville currently serves as the, as the chief judge in Fulton County Superior Court. Uh, per the Fulton County Superior Court website, he has been a lawyer for 37 years and has served as a judge for 29 years. 19 of which as a Superior Court judge in Fulton County. Judge Glanville knows the rule concerning ex parte communications, both, both in the uniform rules of Superior Court and in the Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct. Based on the experience of prosecutors Hilton and Love, as well as the experience of Judge Glanville, the notion that the decision to hold these repeated, secret, illegal, and unethical ex parte uh, meetings were due to inexperience or simple lapses in judgment does not pass any test. I, I would say fails to pass any test, personally. These were conscious decisions to secretly violate the most basic of Mr. Stilwell's constitutional rights. Several factors in this case, including the prosecutor's and trial judge's wealth of experience, the egregiousness of the prosecutorial and judicial misconduct, the facts that the evidence presented uh, so far has been far from overwhelming. The structural and reversible error already baked into this case and the repeated violations of these rules all clearly support a finding that their actions were intentional and designed to go to mistrial. See, general, see generally State v. Jackson, Anderson v. State, uh, and Wilson v. State. Okay, so I'll, I'll, we can look at those cases at some other time. Conclusion 32. This case is constitutionally and legally broken at this time. Mr. Stilwell is not requesting a mistrial absent a finding of goading, but appropriate, appropriate remedies must exist. Possible remedies include, but are not limited to, disqualification of the prosecutors involved in this misconduct, Judge Glanville has already been recused, the dismissal of this indictment with prejudice, instructions to the sitting jury that explaining the situation uh, explaining the situation in full candor and or mistrial with a finding that a mistrial caused by judicial and prosecutorial misconduct and the defense was goaded into any such request. Wherefore, undersigned counsel respectfully requests that this court consider Mr. Stilwell's arguments and issue an order which will fully and adequately protect Mr. Stilwell's constitutional rights. So the defense is not expecting their motions for mistrial to be granted, and I'll be honest with you, I do not expect that the defense's motions for mistrial will be granted. So notice that they're trying to, trying to give the judge other options. What are some other options? Number one, disqualification of attorney Love and Hilton. So you can disqualify the prosecutors. Dismissal of the indictment with prejudice or instructing the jury about everything that's happened. Respectfully submitted, Max Sharp, and then uh, this is a certify that I have this day served a copy 
of the within and foregoing motion via electronic filing as well as via email to the Fulton County District Attorney or one of her agents. Okay, guys, so that is um, Shannon Stilwell's or Max Sartre's motion, renewed motion for fair and constitutional trial and appropriate remedies for constitutional violations. This was filed on August 2nd, 2024. Okay, guys, so um, let's see if we have anything else. This renewed plea and bar, that was denied, and then that immediate certificate reviewed was denied. Okay, guys, so that is all I'm going to focus on today is Shannon Stilwell's motion. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I'll be back with more legal commentary and motion analysis uh, later on.